Today I'm taking you back to the elegant winters of the 18th and the 19th century when the Victorians popularized ice skating as a pastime activity and as a social event. Ice skating, of course, has been around for thousands of years. It is believed that the earliest ice skating happened in the southern Finland around 5,000 years ago to save energy during winter journeys. Animal bones were used to glide across the flat ice, enabling travelers to cover more ground. The medieval period, an unusually cold period of time, known as the Little Ice Age, brought a sequence of cold periods, especially to the northern latitudes, over the next hundred or so years, all the way up to the mid-1800s. This Little Ice Age meant rivers like Thames froze over completely, settling the scene for the growth of tremendous interest of ice skating. While forms of footwear for sliding across frozen water had existed for centuries before the approach of the industrial era, they were not widespread. All that would change around the mid-1800s for two reasons. First, advances in the skates themselves allowed them to be more comfortable, safer and more available to the masses. And the second, societal norms were changing just enough so that men and women could interact under certain prescribed circumstances. Besides skating being seen as a morally acceptable activity, it was difficult for unmarried individuals to be monitored on a crowded ice rink by an older family member who might not want to be physically able to keep up with them on the ice. In England, the sport became popular amongst the aristocracy in the early 18th century and the first organized skating club was formed in the 1740s in Edinburgh, while the next oldest was not until 1830 in London. By the middle of the 19th century, ice skating was a firm British favorite and Queen Victoria and Prince Albert themselves used ice skating trips to get to know each other more. Prince Albert was an enthusiastic skater and often popped down to skate on the Lake Frogmore estate. Queen Victoria took some lessons from a private tutor, but she preferred to be pushed around in her sledge. On one occasion, when the Prince Albert was skating in the gardens at Buckingham Palace, the ice broke under him and Queen Victoria helped him to get out of the water. Prince Albert then returned to the palace to have a hot bath and a rest. In mid-Victorian England, ice skating was the most popular and enjoyable form of entertainment. Ice rinks were appearing all over the place. Many were temporary during the winter season, but advances in technology also led to the development of indoor ice rinks. Indeed, due to the popularity of ice skating, it was inconceivable that the fashion would not evolve around it, the fashion being so essential to the lives of those in the Victorian era. Women's skirts were obviously raised to prevent tripping on the ice, and warm fur was warm around the ice. Although muffs were not to be taken on the ice so that the skater's arms were not impeded. Bright colors were seen particularly, as contrary to some popular belief, the Victorians loved brightly colored clothes. Many women would sit on skating sleds that would be pushed by men, and so in the sleds women of course had to wrap up much warmer as they were not moving, usually being draped in thick fur coats and blankets. Men tended to wear black, dark blue or green outfits with hats and tailcoats with tight fitting trousers, though sometimes they would dress more warmly. Because ice skating was often said to involve too many hard knocks for beginners, new skaters sometimes look to conveyances to help them. One popular conveyor skaters used was something they could push. It was a skating sled or skating chair and afforded users a certain amount of support for stability as they learned. These popular conveyances also had other advantages. For example, they diminished a beginner's chance of falling or suffering injury. They also allowed children, feeble people or ladies to enjoy time on the ice in a safe and relaxing way, as another skater could push them from behind. One gentleman's etiquette book noted, for all skaters, even those pushing skating sleds or skating chairs, it was an unspoken rule to keep to the right. If done religiously, supposedly it reduced the number of collisions and consequent contusions.
Ice skating became enormously popular in both London and New York City in the 1860s, with a rink opening in Central Park during the winter of the 1859. It is with the opening of the Central Park rink that we see the best evidence of the societal factors that were encouraging the trend with the experiment of the ladies' pond. If you don't believe that interacting in public with a member of opposite sex was truly a new luxury in the Victorian era, the short-lived ladies' pond in the Central Park may convince you. Its inclusion in the new park is proof enough that innocent flirting and socializing could be seen as truly scandalous. Assuming that enough people would find it inappropriate for men and women to skate together, a separate rink was set aside for female skaters who wished to enjoy the ice in the most proper way. While a separate area was created for women to skate and rest separate from men, it proved so unpopular that it was integrated into the rest of the rink by the 1870s. New Yorkers' love affair with ice skating began in the winter of the 1858-59 in Central Park. In December 1858, before the park was officially completed, the newly dug lake at the 72nd Street was flooded, frozen and declared open for skating. First hundreds, then thousands, and then tens of thousands of curious skaters trekked upon and took to the ice. Women included. Skating mania seized the city. One of the very few recreational options open to women at the time, skating was widely regarded as a healthy, cheap and innocent form of outdoor exercise for both sexes and all ages, good for straightening the body and clearing the mind. It was one of the very few recreational options open to women at the time, but no doubt a powerful factor in skating's popularity was that for the buttoned-up Victorians, skating was one of the few activities where women and men might enjoy close and enhanced encounters in public. Popular Victorian prints and paintings of the skating in the city featured couples in various stages of flirtation and courtship, all while showing off the latest fashions. In the 1862 print below by Courier and Eves, from left to right we see a young man desperately pursue his love whose bloomers are showing, then a grounded, confident pair holding hands in the middle, followed by a middle-aged man pushing his partner on a chair, and finally a rather well-fed couple watching their children learn to skate. In an era of consistent chaperones, the prospect of gliding and possibly falling on the ice or falling into someone's arms had to be exhilarating. Young women could move around the ice while the older chaperones watched from a distance in warming huts and married women could skate with other men. While off-ice propriety dictated floor-length skirts, women skating could wear slightly shorter skirts that showed off their ankles, which were then considered an erogenous zone. Gliding together in tandem, pulling apart but then coming back together for a twirl, an embrace or even a fall offered inherently romantic possibilities. Maybe that's one reason why the ladies' pond did not last long. The skaters preferred mixed company. Paintings and prints from the 1860s show New Yorkers gliding like peacocks on ice in top hats and form-fitting waistcoats, fur muffs, velvet bonnets and voluminous skirts. Accompanying the skaters were live bands playing waltzes, refreshment stands, and warming huts where one could rent skates or simply watch the show. On weekends, the park stayed open until midnight, the scene brilliantly lit by calcium or gas lamps, and ideally moonlight as in John O'Brien's Inman 1878 scene of skating on the lake next to the newly completed Battersea Terrace. Now let's look at these beautiful ice skates from the early Victorian era. These skates are a combination of wood, brass and steel. The base is made of wood, the heel cap and the hardware surrounding the blade is made of brass and the blade of skate itself is made of steel. There are also five steel spikes sticking up from the base of the skate. These were meant to be worn with your existing boots, which would have had a heavy leather sole. The small steel spikes would help you keep the skate in place. These also would have leather straps tied around them, 
to keep your shoe from sliding. The steel runners are flat, so there have been no edges cut into them. For a modern skater, trying these out today, I'm sure they would have been difficult to use. This is the end of our little trip to the Victorian era. Thank you very much for watching and I hope you enjoyed this little trip.